I want to welcome everyone back in again. We now have the talk by our two uh, priests here. We want to have them talk about this, the sacrament of confession, which many times is misunderstood. In today's world, many people don't know what confession is. Many people don't go to confession. So this is an opportunity to help us understand better the sacrament of confession and means of proper ways to go to confession. And we thought this way, you know, to set it up like this in a format with questions from you is really what you want to hear. Um, the, the priests, I have to say, I don't, hope you don't mind, they, they had asked if they could, while doing this, instead of water, they could have a little glass of cognac. And we told them no, because we, we, we'd end up with six or eight of our priests up here. <laughs> so with that, fathers, it's yours. Uh, before we start, I just would like to mention that uh, whenever I give a retreat, I usually give retreats out in California, at Alhambra, with the um, Carmelite sisters. And whenever I have a retreat, I say to the, the people on the retreat, when you're going to confession, it's not counseling. It's not spiritual direction. It's confession. And so you need, you're going to have to tell the priest your sins, not your husband's sins, not your wife's sins, and not your mother-in-law's sins your sins, and then the priest will give you a penance. It's not really the place to start talking about things that have nothing to do with the sacrament. Sometimes people want to talk and chat, and you've got 50 people waiting out in the line. So when you go to confession, uh, I think one of the images Pope Francis gave once was, it's like uh, a person in the uh, battlefield, you got your leg blown off. You don't say, hey, how's it going? You want that leg treated right away. You want the blood to stop bleeding. You want them to be patched up as soon as possible. So Father and I, and all priests and bishops, when we hear confessions, we're trying to do a little spiritual ER there. And uh, so we want you to tell us your sins, your sins, nobody else's, and then we give you the penance. It's not the place to argue theologically if you don't like so-and-so. Okay? You can talk to somebody else at another time for that. Yeah, I uh, concur with the uh, not confessing other people's sins. <laughs> uh, in Latin America, we would hear confessions every, fr every Thursday uh, for at least eight to ten man hours. And I would always go out in front of the line and say, ladies, excuse me, ladies, ladies, if you confess your husband's sins, I'll give you the penance they deserve. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> and that usually stopped that. <laughs> anyway, so we have some fine questions here, I, uh, and so we're just going to grab them and see how we go. This is like the parish 50-50 here, okay? <laughs> okay, Father. It's kind of a different kind of bingo. Yeah, a different kind of bingo. All right. What is official church position on general absolution? Okay. Well, general absolution... Um, it's different from having a general confession. Some people will go to confession and want to go over their whole life. Um, you never have to confess sins that have already been confessed. They're obviously absolved. General absolution, however, is a very rare instance where um, a priest is unable to hear the confessions of people who would not be able to get there in a reasonable amount of time. I can only think of one instance where that applied. In my diocese of Harrisburg, when Three Mile Island was ready to blow up, the bishop gave one and only instance of general absolution where the pastor came out because there was literally a thousand people in church and after they got their confession, they were going to run out of the state. So he gave them a general absolution, but the, provi the proviso is that you must confess the very next time you have a chance that you, what you would have confessed. And then the priest gives what they call a general absolution. But he can only do that if it's an emergency and if the penitent has the intention of going to confession the very next time they're able to. It's not enough to say, well, Father didn't plan ahead of time. You know, it's a Latin or Advent prayer service and not enough priests didn't show up. If Father and I have to stay in there for eight hours, that's what we, what we were ordained to do. But it would be an undue burden, not so much on us, but on you. So obviously you wouldn't be able to wait, you know, 18 hours to go to confession. So it's not that often that it happens, but sometimes priests, I hate to say it, 
use it uh, illicitly and uh, even invalidly if they say to people, okay, too many people to go to confession today, so I'm going to absolve you, you're all done. Because you have to tell the priest all mortal sins that were not previously confessed. I've only seen it happen once, and that was in wartime when the, a, a group of soldiers uh, were going to go into combat, and they wanted to go to confession, but there was no time, and they had to leave for the front. And so that's a perfectly legitimate moment, but they were explained all those things. Um, confession, how, many, how may we evangelize about, re, uh, about returning to confession to fellow Catholics and promote confession to non-Catholics? Talk about how great it feels when you come out of there with that monkey off your back. <laughs> you know, seriously. Uh, talk, one of the, the greatest lines I ever heard was from our dear departed Father Benedict when he was studying a psychology at Columbia, and it was from a Jewish psychologist who said, Father, you Catholic priests, you can get to the bottom of something in 10 minutes in confession that I, as a psychologist or a psychiatrist, can't do in 10 years. It's, it's very practical. You know, the, I, as an ex-Protestant, will tell you the difference between you know, telling Jesus my sins in the air versus getting it out in the light. It feels totally different. It's totally different because there's a, there's a real thing that happens, one. But the devil likes to keep things hidden and dark. So when we bring something out into the light, uh, it, it helps us, right? And it helps us get some advice, right? Uh, it, so that's the way I would evangelize about it. It's effective. It's efficacious. Jesus is very practical, oftentimes more practical than we are. And he gave us this wonderful sacrament, which we find in the scriptures, John chapter 20, 21, 22, 23. Uh, it's right there. He gave them the authority to uh, forgive sins. Get out there and talk about it and talk about your experience. And if you notice, when people say, I, I can't tell my sins to another human being, but they'll go on Facebook and tell everybody everything. <laughs> yeah. Or they'll go on Oprah and tell you all their dirty laundry. But God forbid they go to a priest who can't tell anybody. Oprah blabs, all right? I have once been to confession and the priest gave me no absolution, but instead said, you are forgiven. He also gave me no penance, but instead just told me to thank the Lord. Was this confession valid or not? Okay. Um, the priest needs to give the proper words. You know, we, we go back to what was taught to us uh, at the Council of Trent and in the catechism today too. You know, there's proper matter, form, and intention. And so the priest has to give you the proper uh, words of absolution. And, uh, you know, the, the essential part that he must say, I absolve you from your sins in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But then there's that other part he must also say too. You know, God the Father mercies and so forth. Those are the words he has to say. If, if he changes those, it's like if a priest at Mass, he has to say, this is my body, this is my blood. If he changes that, it's an invalid Mass. If he changes the words of absolution, it's an invalid confession. Now, if you go to confession and you weren't sure because you didn't hear properly and you're unsure, you're, you're in doubt, um, and God forbid you get run over by a truck, uh, well, your intention was to go to confession. And so the church, um, we say Ecclesia Sulpa, would supply in that case. But if you don't get run over by a truck and you're concerned that you may, the priest may have not said the proper words, then you need to go to confession again. But I would go to a different priest. Okay. Now, he's supposed to give you a penance. You know, it could be a Hail Mary, a Glory Be. It could be go um, do a work of mercy. But um, I know some priests don't give penances and... You know, that's part of the, the sacrament as well. You know, there must be satisfaction made. You must do the penance. Now, some people forget what their penance is. They come out of the box and, oh, what was that? Three Hail Marys or was it three Our Fathers? Um, you can ask the priest uh, if, it's, if it's reasonable or if you're unsure, you know, you can say a, a, a couple of prayers that would, it would suffice. Um, but if it's something major, like if you had confessed a big sin, like abortion, uh, and the priest gave you a, a serious penance and you forgot or you didn't do it, I would go to confession again and explain that to the priest so that you get an adequate uh, penance for that. I'm putting some of these aside. It's not because they're not good questions, but they're being touched on already. So if you see me 
setting a question beside, it's not because we don't want to answer it, it's because it's being answered, okay? What counsel would you give someone who regularly receives the sacrament of reconciliation and the Eucharist but struggles with repeating the same sin even though they are truly contrite for the sin? Well, firstly, a lot of people come to me and they say, I keep saying the same thing. I'm like, well, at least you're not inventing something new. That's good, you know? And then they feel somehow like they're abusing the sacrament by coming back again and again and again. And I try to say, well, how often do you sweep your house? Does the dust ever look really different? It's dust, it's not any different. It's always the same. And if you're fighting against it, you know, the Lord knows you're trying to do your lousy best, right? If it's mortal sin, now we need to, we need to come up, maybe, maybe with a, a particular sin you need to say, okay, I need a game plan here and I need to figure out my counterattack. How am I keeping, are you really tactically looking at how you keep falling into these particular sins and figuring out a way to fight against it? And depending on what sin it is would determine how you would do that. But be not afraid if you're continually saying the same thing over and over again. Dust in the house always looks pretty similar, right? Especially when we're dealing with venial sin. If it's mortal sin, I'm going to get more concerned about that and I'm going to really want to help a penitent uh, have a game plan. You know, uh, yeah, it's like when you go to the doctor. If you got a bad leg, it's usually always that same bad leg. You run out of the doctor's office mad because the doctor says, "Oh, that, that leg's bothering you again." Well, yeah, that's why I'm here. It's when you take the sin trivially, when you start taking it for granted, and you say, "Well, that's just the way I am." Bad habits need to be replaced by good habits. Okay, they're more difficult to replace, obviously, when they're habitual but we have to work at it. So you can't go to either extreme where you become scrupulous and you think everything is a mortal sin or the other extreme where you're completely lax and you see no sin where it's all over the place. So you want to keep that, you know, um, avoiding the, the, the um, extremes. And the only way you can do that is by regular confession. Go regularly. All right. Oh, my turn. Your turn. I feel like the great Karnak. Remember from the Johnny Carson show? You need the hat. <laughs> Seal and mayonnaise jar, Funk and Wagnalls, okay. Should a priest in the confession have, quote, follow-up for someone who habitually omits some sin, as in getting drunk or some other penance to be given, uh, like avoiding alcohol? Okay. Follow-up. Um, well, a priest could suggest, because we can never bind someone to do anything outside the confessional, but they could suggest, you know, maybe... Um, you can come back and, and see me uh, privately or for, for spiritual direction. Um, or Because what we hear in the confessional, we can never use. So when someone comes in and says, Father, I got the same sin as the last time, I'm not allowed to remember that. So you're going to have to refresh my memory. It's not that I'm stupid or I got a bad memory, but I do. But uh, when we're in the confessional, you, know, you can't just presume Father remembers your sins because we're not supposed to. So you may be confessing uh, something that needs to be quote-unquote followed up. So we can suggest and say, like if you have something habitual, like you have alcoholism, drug addiction, gambling, pornography. Pornography is one of the most prevalent sins today. And we tell people, okay, go to confession regularly, but you may need to speak to someone about that a professional counselor or get something to put like on your computer. But I can't morally obligate them to do that. I could suggest it. And that, that would be sort of a follow-up. Yeah. Yeah, I've got no. Um, is it ever licit to correct an erring priest hearing my confession if he says something contrary to the magisterium? Or at least is it licit to state what the church teaches? I think it's always illicit to state what the church teaches. You know what I mean? We're not about silencing the truth by any stretch of the imagination, but we always need to say the truth in love. You know, uh, there's an old saying, uh, love without truth lies, but truth without love kills. We need the two together, Jesus' love and truth itself, both simultaneously. So you're going to have to figure out how to say what the truth is to this priest who may be obdurate. He may not know the truth. He may be, I don't know what, but speak the truth in love. And that's your only opportunity too, because if you're in the confessional and you say, Father, I, I, I masturbated and he says, well, that's not a sin. Well, he's wrong. 
and you have to call him on it. But you can only call him on it in the confessional because outside the box, he's not allowed to talk about it. And you can't go to the, the bishop and say something because he can't answer any questions because once he heard it in the confessional, he can't talk about it. So the only place to talk about it is when you're there talking about it. Okay, sometimes in confession, the priest will not ask me to say an act of contrition. Is this improper or something that would invalidate my confession? Okay, you do need to express your sorrow in some form. Now, most people have an act of contrition they know from, from childhood. Um, when I was newly ordained, the problem was there was like 8,000 ones that were available, and the kid would go, Father, I'm stuck. Well, so am I, because I don't know, know which one you know. Uh, that's why we would print out little versions. The bare minimum that you need to say is, is uh, something like, Jesus, have mercy on me, a sinner. You have to express sorrow. So not only you have to tell the priest what your sins are, you must somehow express that you are sorry for them. I could kill somebody, and I could tell you I killed somebody, but I have to also tell you that I'm sorry that I killed them. Yeah. Otherwise, there's no matter for the... The priest can't absolve something that's not there. He can only absolve your sorrows. I, you know, as a hearing confessions with lines out the, out the door uh, that we would have to cut out off after four, six, eight hours, you know, sometimes a priest will forget. <laughs> you don't even know no, whether no. you whether you heard the act of contrition or not. You're like half comatose. So don't get scrupulous about it. And sometimes the priest and I will do. I confess. I've done, I confess. I have done this. I say, Are you sorry for all your sins? And they say, Yes. And that's good enough. You know, because you know there's 500 people waiting and there's only me. So it, I was told by a priest once that he would no longer hear my children's or my confessions because we go too often. Our sins are not mortal sins, and we go once a week as a family. That crushed me, and that priest would say that I avoid, would say that I avoid him now. First of all, let me beg forgiveness for my brother priest for saying that to you, that he should never have said that. Um, the, I, I'm never going to discourage somebody for cleaning their house, you know, uh, I may, I don't want somebody to be scrupulous if they're going every day to confession and like, all right, let's, let's, let's talk about that. Uh, we don't, we should know, uh, we should be formed as Catholics to know well enough that I don't have to go to confession every Saturday just so I can receive con communion on Sunday if there's no mortal sin. It's only mortal sin that impedes communion, not venial sin, even if you feel really bad about it. If it's only venial sin, you don't have to go to confession before you receive the Blessed Sacrament. So I've run into that a lot, and it's kind of a, not full scruples, but it's a little bit, right? But I, so I generally say, if somebody asks me a question, you know, how often should I go to confession? I say, you know, if you're not in any kind of mortal sin, once a month it's good. We don't have a lot of priests, you know? I mean, we, we want to make room for folks that, that, you know, that really need to get there, but at the same time, I'm not going to discourage anybody. If anybody really wants to go once a week, I'm not going to say no. I'm going to say, if it's a burden to you, please do it once a month. If you love coming in every week and sitting in the line, I'm happy to have you. <laughs> yeah, we don't have separate lines like the express at, at checkout yeah. at the supermarket, so we don't say, okay, if you've only been once a week or something, so uh, don't feel you have to be uh, concerned about that, but as Father said, some people have undue stress. They say, I, I didn't get to confession yet this week. Well, you know, if you want to go, you, you, you can go, you should go, and the priest will not, he shouldn't chew you out for coming in. No. But if you're going every day, he might be a little concerned that you're borderline uh, scrupulous there. Um, here's one. When is it or is it ever proper or efficacious to confess a previously confessed mortal sin? Um, Normally speaking, once the sin's been confessed, it's done with, okay? I know some people, again, like to make what we call a general confession, not a general absolution, where they like to go over their past sins. I tend not to encourage that too often because people can then, how many times is, well, if I did it once, can I do it twice? Can I do it three times? Once it's been absolved, it's like if you are in prison, you rob the bank, okay? I got relatives that are maybe in that category. And, <laughs> and the governor pardons you. The pardons, that's, you only get one pardon, okay? You, you, can't get, you can't get a re-pardon. So once you've been absolved, you're absolved. It's done with, okay? But I know sometimes people, particularly if it's been a real bad sin, like something like uh, um, 
murder, uh, uh, abortion, uh, any number of things that's very bad. You may say, Father, I need to say it again. But you, the priest will remind you, you are forgiven. So, you know, you have to take Jesus at his word when he says those sins are forgiven. Because some people don't believe it. Well, then you're making Jesus out to be a liar. Because he says, who sins you shall forgive, they are forgiven them. There's no f fine print there. I typically encounter this one, uh, particularly with women or men who've been involved with abortion. Because it's such a... It's such a wound in their hearts. And really what they're expressing is, I don't feel right yet. Yeah. So generally what I, I suggest is, one, if somebody's ever experienced an abortion and participated on any level with that, go to a good retreat like the Sisters of Life have or the, uh, in Spanish is Vina de Raquel, uh, Rachel's Vineyard uh, retreat or something like that, to get the tools that you need to be able to handle and to be able to get deeper healing. Because that's what your heart's telling you. And one of the, just a real general quick thing is I would say if, if there's whatever sin from the past that keeps surfacing and you know you've confessed it and you know you were sincere, but it keeps running through, remember God gave you a memory for a reason. This is maybe in a way part of your purgatory. So how do you deal with that? You remember it, you thank God for the forgiveness you already received, and then you pray for whatever people were involved with that sin. So that's rep, rep, reparative you know, for whatever you did with or against somebody else. And then you maybe offer the very pain, the kind of the wincing feeling that you have uh, for somebody that's in the same temptation right now, for a woman that wants to abort. So that takes that negative energy and it flips it on its head and does something positive with it. Uh, but you don't need to bring it back to confession with, with because it's forgiven already. Uh, the general confessions that Father mentioned, I would only suggest for people to do those like at major junctures in life. Like just before I made final vows, I did a general confession. Yeah. Uh, just before ordination, I did one. You know, if it's just before somebody is going to get married, I would do that. But it shouldn't be like yeah, every five years or whatever. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. And also, um, if you're unsure if you confess the sin, you can obviously mention it, but. Uh, God's not like the IRS. Mm -hmm. He's not going to audit you and then bring up something you forgot. Yeah, that, okay? that's what Because that's why is. we say, for these sins and all my sins. So sins you legitimately forgot are forgiven. It's only the ones that you know about, that you freely, knowingly did, and you refuse to confess them. So for you to refuse it means you know what you did, and you remember it. Then it's an invalid confession. But if you forgot something, there's where we have that lovely little you know, a lacuna there where you say, for these sins and all my sins that I may have forgotten, that takes care of it. So you don't have to worry that, you know, 50 years from now, God's going to say, well, you forgot one back in 1927 uh, or something. You just answered this question. Thank oh, you. Oh, well, there you go. Hey. <laughs> it's the I mean, great, literally. It's the great That's Karnak. exactly what that question it's was. It's the great Karnak. <laughs> the great Karnak. Is it or okay to be asked to say, no, we already did that one, act of, not to act, the, do the act of tradition. We already talked about that. Let me do another one. Let's see the Karnak is, is it valid or good to confess? Uh, is it a valid or good confession of the priest does not allow the penitent to say how long it's been since the last confession and not have you recite the act of contrition? So we had, we already talked about the act of contrition. It's, uh, you don't have to say how long it's been, but at the same time, it's a help for me as a priest. I want to know, the reason why we, we want to know that, um, it's not curiosity, it's to give an idea, you know, where's the, where's the state of this person's soul? If it's been 38 years, it's a good, I'm going to handle that confession differently than, than if it's been a week, right? And so uh, that's, that's the reason why. If, if somebody says it's been one day, I'm like, okay, and... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to handle it differently. So, Yeah, so if somebody says it's been 40 years and I can't think of anything, hmm, <laughs> hmm. In terms of apologetics, how can I explain to a non-Catholic why a priest or, quote, middleman, as some non-Christians call priest, is needed for confession? Why? Ask Jesus. He's the one who gave us the sacrament. He breathed on the apostles after Easter and said, receive the Holy Spirit whose sins you shall forgive are forgiven them, whose sins you shall retain are retained. Jesus never wasted his breath. He never wasted any words. So why would he breathe on them and give them the Holy Spirit and specifically say, whose sins you shall forgive? He didn't say, whose sins I forgive. He says, whose sins you shall forgive, and he said it to the apostles. 
So he obviously gave that gift to the apostles, and we have from the ancient writings going back to apostolic times, uh, St. Irenaeus and others that mention people went to confession. It wasn't just the Middle Ages in the time of Martin Luther. They were consistently going to confession from day one. So it, it shows us there's continuity, and if somebody wants to know why, take it up with the guy upstairs. He's the one who came up with it. If, for some reason, a confessor is not properly disposed to give absolution, for example, if he was in a state of mortal sin during his conferring of holy orders, or if he was an, improp an, an imposter, such as a Stasi agent, and the penitent is unaware and truly thinks he is able to give absolution, will God honor the absolution for the sake of the penitent? Yes. I mean, you don't know. You, you, you're, you, uh, we kind of touched on this before. I guess if you find out if it's an invalid uh, absolution, then you, then you go back, to, you go to another priest and you say, you know, I, I went to confession and you explain it to him and I'd like to, I'd like to go again. I wouldn't refuse that. But God's merciful. You know, God is merciful. You did your lousy best, and somebody else on the other side, no fault of your own, was, was a, a, an imposter or whatever it was. Now, if a priest was in mortal sin when he was conferring, as the orders were conferred on him, he, th those orders are valid. It's just that he's not disposed to receive all that grace, but they're valid. He's validly ordained. A, mortal, a, a priest in mortal sin can confect the Eucharist. Jesus still shows up. A priest in mortal sin can give you absolution. Jesus still does his work even through knuckleheads. Okay? Yeah, the Council of Trent made that very clear because that came up at the time of the Reformation. What happens when bad priests celebrate sacraments? And Trent made it clear, ex opere operato, that the sacraments infallibly are valid, okay, even if the priest is in mortal sin because you have the right to have the sacrament. So if the priest is, is in mortal sin, that's why when people, when the scandals came out, people say, well, Father, I was married by that, that pervert that they talked about last week. You're still married, okay? All the confessions he heard, all the masses he said were all valid. He committed the sin of sacrilege, though. He's got a lot of sins on his soul because every time he celebrated a sacrament in the state of mortal sin was another sin. So he's in big trouble. You don't have anything to worry about. Now, the only times you have to be concerned is in terms of marriage. If the priest didn't have the faculties for, to marry you, then you know you may have to get what they call a, a, a sonatio from the local bishop um, that can be easily done. If because sometimes a priest might be visiting and he didn't get proper delegation, then that's something that you have to go through through your local bishop uh, to get done. But if th there's a priest in the confessional who doesn't have faculties or he's pretending and you don't know it, okay, you went in good faith, your, your, your sins are actually truly forgiven. If you got a fake priest at the wedding, however, you're still single people. Yep. <laughs> I think it's your turn. Oh, my turn. I almost forgotten there. Yeah, maybe I'll ask more. Okay. What is correct way to handle a family event if an uncle or brother attain, attends with his same-sex partner? Okay. Well, so you're not a confessional matter, but um, what to do if a family member comes with their significant other here? Okay. Um, that's something, I mean, we have to be, I don't want to use the word too lightly because people have been um, using it too much lately, but tough love. But we have to be real, okay? And we can't treat something that's wrong as if it's not wrong. But we can do it in a Christian way. Okay? We don't have to be uh, mean or nasty or, or insulting, but the same token, you know, as I say to parents, you know, when your son or daughter comes home from college, or even if they're out of college, that doesn't mean that you should let them sleep with their, their girlfriend or boyfriend in the house. You say, absolutely not. This is my home, and, you know, if they want to go do it somewhere else, that, that, that's a sin they can commit. But you become a cooperator in evil, if you allow sin to happen under your roof that you know about, and you say, no, this doesn't, this doesn't happen in my house. Now, if somebody comes to a, an event, you know, um, are you acknowledging validity upon something? It depends. You know, if you are acting and, and like throwing a, a bridal shower, all right, for, for somebody, a, a woman who's marrying another woman, that's not 
the right way to do it because that's giving a false message. Throwing a party for them or going to that, to that bridal shower uh, would be wrong. But if they come over for dinner, you know, to say no, you slam the door in their face, I don't necessarily think that would be the proper way to respond. But, you know, as uh, long as you don't convey to anyone, uh, particularly your loved ones or to anyone in the public, that you condone and, and uh, agree with this. And, you know, non-Catholics do it quite well. I've had a number of weddings where they came to a Catholic wedding, they sat up front and gave that look like, we're not happy to be here. So, and you, but they came, all right? They're not condoning what's happening, but they're there. And I say to Catholics, you know, why don't we try that? Why is it that we have to say, oh, well, we don't want to rock the boat, go along, get along. We don't want to close the door. I think we sometimes have to be strong in the faith, but always with charity. Agreed. That's our last question. Well, there you go. I don't know how much, okay. how much time do we have? Are we, do we, we want to field some open questions? We have 10 minutes. Okay. Well, I, I, do you know I, any I don't think songs? Is ready for do that. you want to dance? There's a lady right here in the front row. It's, it's not a requirement. It's a good thing to do. It, uh, it, it visually allows me to show you the penitent that we are in confession now, and this is a this is kind of like a break off point for whatever other conversation is going on. But if he doesn't have the stole, it doesn't inval invalidate things. I've heard confessions in parking lots uh, where somebody just wanted to do a quote unquote drive by confession, uh, <laughs> and, and literally, and but they. And they, you know, and I, I didn't, couldn't fish out my stole, or I didn't want to make it obvious that the person was asking for a confession at that moment, so that I didn't want to, anybody else to think, well, what did he do that he has to go to confession at a parking lot? You know, right? so I didn't whip out my stole. So it's not an invalidating thing; it's a practical thing. Yeah. It would be illicit if this was a norm. He keeps doing this on a regular basis because he should look like a priest. Um, the, the ritual does say that you should be either in, in your clerical garb or in a cassock and surplice or an alb and have a stole. But like Father said, if this was at the spur of the moment, um, I heard a confession once of, of, a, of a policeman and uh, I was on the street and he stopped me and I thought I was jaywalking or something and I heard his confession and I got nervous because as I'm given absolution, a squad car pulls up and they see this cop on the ground and I'm not, and they're pulling out their guns, you know. And <laughs> I said, please, after I gave him absolution, tell your friends that you're okay. <laughs> did that really happen? It did happen, yes, oh, Father. Really yes. Yeah, you. <laughs> Priest. Good luck. Did y'all hear that? The, the question is, she's heard that, that, that she's heard indirectly that the government might try, and I know some of the governments Australia. have tried, Australia has tried, to make it so that priests have to reveal in confession if there's like abuse or whatever. And I say, good luck, because we're not going to do it. You know, the, we have martyrs in our faith that have died to keep the seal of confession that way. It doesn't matter what the government says in that po at that point, that law becomes illicit, and we're, you know, if we're worth our salt, we're going to be, be faithful. We, I'm, I'm with the confraternity of Catholic clergy. <laughs> Thomas McKenna is our executive director for our confraternity of Catholic clergy. We filed a brief, a Mikas Curie brief with the Supreme Court because in one of the states here in the United States, they tried to force a priest to reveal what was heard in the confessional. And even though it was the penitent who said it was okay, that's not enough. Because what you hear in the confessional, even if the penitent wants to blab, they can blab all they want. I could still not tell you who was in there and what they said. And we filed a brief with the Supreme Court to say that this is, this is sacrosanct. I mean, it's, it's of the same level civilly as a doctor, patient, an attorney, client. But for us, spiritually, it's even higher than that. It's the seal of confession. We have to be willing to die for it, tortured to death, and when you tell that to people that, you know, this priests have died, and rather than the real, and look, here's what I find interesting. 
with all these bad priests who have been around for centuries. Have you ever heard of any of them who got sold a book on what they heard in confessional? Even the worst of the worst, the worst filth that ever entered the priesthood who left, who, who no longer practiced any faith whatsoever, even the very bad ones have not blabbed what they heard in the confessional. That tells you something right there, that even the worst of the worst would never dare go down that road. The, the question is whether it'd be helpful to go back to the screen so then you, because then you couldn't tell who's on the other side and vice versa. The screens are helpful. Uh, they're helpful on many different levels. Um, it kind of curtails conversation for one. <laughs> uh, but it, I also, it, it's a matter of comfort zone. Um, I, I, those are practical reasons that would make it helpful, but it's, I don't know. It, 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 as a priest, you have the right to insist to have the anonymity. You as a penitent can say, I want to go face to face, but the priest can say, I refuse to hear confessions face to face. Like, I know the Fathers of Mercy, when they come to the parish, they say, Father, we only do by the screen. And because of the recent things that have been going on, I tend to think it would be better for us as priests to say, I'd rather have that screen so that nobody could accuse me of doing anything. And if the, if the civil government would ever try to ask me who went, I'd have to say, I don't know. I don't recognize voices. I don't even know my own voice. How am I going to know who's on the other side? But I think the screen was there for a purpose. In the Middle Ages, when there was occasions when priests were misbehaving or whatever, we may need to go back to that. Uh, but that's something I think you know, the bishops may uh, want to discuss when they get uh, together in November. We have time for one more question. There's a lady jumping up, up and okay, down. She, who's, all right. Needs an exorcism or something. If we're, if, we're, if we're quick, we might get a second one. All right, shoot. Is it okay for the priest to peek? <laughs> no. It's uh, not like let's make a deal and Monty Hall's got something <laughs> behind the curtain. I think we, the, this lady over here. Yes, ma'am. Well, there's a difference between illicit and invalid. Illicit means it's illegal and it's not proper, but invalid means it's not really a sacrament. So we have to always make that distinction. If, like, for instance, if Father were to try to say Mass without vestments, it would be illicit, but it would still be valid. Okay, he's committing a sin do and doing something wrong, but it would be a valid Mass, okay? <laughs> uh, we almost had that uh, earlier with, 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 with our stole situation, but that doesn't matter. But, um, <laughs> so if, some, if, so, if a priest does something that's illicit, he's not, he shouldn't be doing that, but you don't have to worry that it invalidates the sacrament. Now, it's I, what's valid that you have to... So her question, it was a twofold question. One was about the stole, but the other part was, I absolve you, and that's all he says. So that yeah, makes that, it invalid. That would be invalid, because he needs be to invalid. say the formula. You have to say the formula yeah. of absolution, yeah. which is... Your sins are not forgiven? If they say your sins are not forgiven? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. That's not a valid formula for absolution. You have, there's, a, there's a minimum formula that has to be said and the priest has to make the sign of the cross as he's saying it which and that's not it yeah so that's an invalid not illicit or it's illicit and invalid ab does that mean your sins are not forgiven you i would go again to somebody else stop going yeah. to that guy yeah <laughs> Stop going to the guy and tell him, hey, it's Father, like, it's you like know. It's like a quack doctor. You and, don't and want would, to go there no more. I would, I, would, I would tell him, say, Father, you know, this, I, can you please use the full absolution formula? And well, if he print says it out no, and give it to him. It out, it. I did that once myself. I went to confession somewhere, and, and the priest gave something he cooked up, and I said, I pulled out the absolution formula in Spanish, and I said, would you please say this? And he did. And he honestly didn't know that it was invalid the way he'd been doing it. 
So I taught him something. And you can get it on your iPhone now, so I don't understand why priests don't have it. I think that's it. We're, time's up. We've been told that time's up. The, the time, thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Quite, quite an insight and very helpful. I think when the questions come from what's on your mind.